Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us on the Stagecoach as we take a ride back in time to the Old West with Where the Wind Takes You by Leroy A. Peters, read by Justin King. Where the Wind Takes You by Leroy A. Peters Read by Justin King Chapter 1 A Brother's Betrayal April 1st, 1806 Beaufort, South Carolina It was a mild, warm spring morning in the South Carolina town of Beaufort. The people were hustling and bustling as usual, and at the docks, ships were coming and going as far as Europe and as close as Canada. There, running his successful shipbuilding business with his two oldest sons, German immigrant and Revolutionary War veteran Isaac Reinhardt was overseeing the finishing touches of his new riverboat that was going to be used to deliver goods to St. Louis. He had started the business not long after he moved to Beaufort from Boston, Massachusetts, back in 1784. Just one year after the war ended at the Battle of Yorktown, Reinhardt was loyal to the American Patriot cause, immigrating to Boston from Hamburg in 1765, when he was just 15 years old. Like his father before him, he was a shipbuilder by trade, and spent most of his life in the family business, building ships that would sail out of Boston Harbor. Shipbuilding was a lucrative business, but it was far from easy. It took a special person with a unique skill to design and build ships and the Reinhardt family was no exception. At age 21, Isaac married the 15-year-old daughter of Irish immigrants, Catherine O'Keefe. Despite strong objections from her parents because of his Lutheran faith, while she was Catholic, the couple were happy. Their marriage would produce ten children, seven sons and three daughters. Their eldest, Lois, was born in 1773. The twins... Isaac Jr. and Ichabod in 1775, Eve in 1778, Esther in 1781. Then, after the war, Isaac uprooted the family from Boston to Beaufort, and in 1785, Philip was born. Then came Malachi in 1787, Isaac in 1790, Micah in 1793, and Manoah in 1795. Now, Isaac Reinhardt was a very tall man. At six feet, nine inches, he was a giant, but years of shipbuilding helped him put muscles on his frame, weighing 275 pounds, while Catherine was a small and petite woman, being five foot two and weighing 130 pounds. Despite her petite frame, she was a strong, able, and independent-minded woman. It was one of the things her husband loved about her, along with her beautiful brown hair and dark brown eyes. Isaac had blonde hair and sky-blue eyes. Much to his pride and joy, most of the Reinhardt children, including the girls, would inherit their father's build and weight, but only two would inherit his blonde hair and blue eyes, 16-year-old Isaiah and 11-year-old Manoah, who was the youngest. Out of all the Reinhardt children, Isaiah was unique, a trait that both his parents noticed. While he often helped and did chores around the home and had no problem working in his father's business down at the docks, he preferred hunting and trapping around the forest and swamps near Beaufort. Ever since his father gave him a musket for his 10th birthday, he had been hunting deer, fox, raccoon, and anything to bring home for the pot or pelt decoration. When Esther got married three years previously, Isaiah shot a black bear, skinned and tanned it, and presented the pelt as a wedding present for his sister, which she and her husband graciously accepted. Isaiah had learned how to tan animal skins from some of his Cherokee Indian friends that lived not far from Beaufort. His parents, despite their wealth, did not own slaves and raised their children to respect other people, regardless of race and religion, which was a radical way of thinking for wealthy white people in Beaufort, South Carolina at the time. While the family did not own slaves, nor subscribed to the practice of slavery, 
Lois and Isaac Jr. had married into slave-owning families. Isaac and Catherine raised their children to be close, and the family was close. However, Philip, who was five years older than Isaiah, was a constant bully and a known womanizer. On many occasions, he and Isaiah would butt heads and their brothers, Isaac Jr. and Ichabod, would have to separate them. Philip was not inherently a mean person. He just liked to pick on his younger siblings. Isaiah was his favorite target because he liked to get a rise out of him. Today was no different when Isaiah had come home from teaching Micah and Manoah how to trap and hunt. Well, look what the cat dragged in, teased Philip. The two youngest Reinhardt children didn't like their older brother's bullying or his constant teasing, but they weren't as brave or hot-tempered as Isaiah was. At his age, Isaiah was 6 feet 4 inches tall and already weighed a muscular 240 pounds, while Philip was an inch taller, but 20 pounds lighter than his younger brother. So Isaiah had little problem standing up to the bully. If I didn't know any better, I thought you three were engines, said Philip. Don't you got anything better to do than bother us, responded Isaiah. Philip just smiled and shrugged. At that moment, their mother walked into the room. Leave them alone, Philip, she said. Your father and brothers will be home soon and you three need to get washed up. What are we having for dinner, Ma? asked Micah. That is up for your sister Lois, answered Catherine. She and David invited us for dinner tonight. They said that they have a surprise for the whole family. Must be a big surprise if she's inviting the whole family, said Isaiah. Can I invite Annabelle? I don't see why not, but we better ask your father and Ichabod, said Catherine. Annabelle Smith was Isaiah's sweetheart. He had been courting her for over a year. He met her through his brother Ichabod, who was married to Annabelle's eldest sister, Leah. She was the daughter of Reverend William and Lovesey Smith, who owned the Reformed Baptist Church of Beaufort. It was spoken among their friends and peers that they would get married, something that both of their parents approved. But Annabelle wanted Isaiah to make something of himself first, like his father and older brothers. While Isaac Jr. and Ichabod were successful in their father's shipbuilding business, Philip had become successful in horse breeding and would sell many of his stallions and mares to some of the wealthiest families in Beaufort and their surrounding areas. Despite his young age, he had become one of the most successful and sought-after bachelors in town. His parents encouraged him to settle down with some nice girl who was interested in him so that he would stop his womanizing. When Isaac and Malachi came home, the boys were almost ready to head to Lois' husband's family plantation. Isaiah wanted to bring Annabelle so badly, but she had been acting weird the last couple of weeks. He thought maybe it was one of those women things that they go through, that he had heard so much about. His father informed him from Ichabod that Annabelle hadn't been feeling well lately. So the youth thought nothing of it, and thought he would visit her after dinner at his sister's. They arrived at Lois and David Jackson's plantation at 5 o'clock that evening. All the Reinhardt family members were there, including all the grandchildren, nine in total. Lois and her husband David had given Isaac and Catherine three healthy grandsons already, and the surprise was that another baby was coming. Mein Gott, it's true, shouted Isaac in his thick German accent. He loved being a grandfather, and finding out that he was getting another one brought him great joy. Isaac Jr., Ichabod, Philip, Malachi, and Isaiah patted their brother-in-law on the back, while his father Joseph handed out cigars to celebrate the good news. It was at that moment one of the house servants announced that Reverend William Smith and Mrs. Smith, along with their daughter, were there, and that they had come to speak with Mr. and Mrs. Reinhardt. That's odd, said Leah. What is so odd about your parents and sister coming over? Asked Ichabod. We did tell them that we were having dinner at Lois and David's home. I know, but my parents wouldn't just show up unannounced unless it was serious, and her father did say he had a church business to attend to. Well, it would appear he wants to speak to us, so it must be serious, said Catherine. Both she and Isaac gave Isaiah a serious look, and as if he were caught with his hand in the cookie jar. I didn't do anything, said Isaiah. I'm sure you didn't, son, said Isaac, while gently patting his son's shoulder. I am sure you didn't.
The servant had announced Reverend and Mrs. Smith along with Annabelle, who was downcast. Isaiah could tell by the expressions on their face that something was wrong, but he couldn't fathom what. Greetings, Reverend Smith, Mrs. Smith, said Joseph Jackson. Greetings, Joseph, said the Reverend cordially. Reverend Smith, greeted Isaac, I am told that you needed to speak for us. You and Isaiah, said the Reverend. Is there some place that we can talk? Y'all can talk in my study, offered Joseph. What the devil did you do, Isaiah? seethed Catherine. Sister Catherine, Isaiah didn't do anything, said Reverend Smith, but he needs to hear this. Now everyone was curious about what was going on, and if Isaiah didn't have anything to do with it, why did he need to hear it? Isaiah, along with his parents and Annabelle and her parents, were standing in Mr. Jackson's study, waiting for Reverend Smith to reveal what was wrong. <sighs> Isaiah, there is no better way for me to say this, so I will come out and say it, he said. Annabelle is with a child. Isaiah remained silent, but he was angry because he knew that he couldn't be the father. He never went beyond a kiss with Annabelle, even though she tried to get him to go further on numerous occasions, but he wouldn't. And two, he was a virgin. Isaiah is a father? asked Isaac, not looking at his son. The reverend shook his head. Unless Annabelle's lying, no, he's not. Then the reverend turned to Isaiah, while his parents had a look of confusion on their faces. Tell me the truth, Isaiah, he said. Is she lying? The youth's anger softened a bit when he looked into the eyes of his sweetheart who had betrayed him. Reverend Smith stood between his daughter and Isaiah to get the latter's attention. Tell me, Isaiah, he said. Whatever you say, I will believe you. Isaiah, are you the father? asked his mother. Isaiah shook his head as he lowered it. I, I can't be, because Annabelle and I never went beyond a kiss. Oh, sweet Jesus, said Levesy Smith. I I I'm sorry, Reverend, said Isaiah. You have nothing to be sorry about, Isaiah, said Reverend Smith. However, Isaac, the father of the baby is one of your sons. Unfortunately, it isn't Isaiah. A shocked look came upon both Isaac and Catherine, while Isaiah's rage returned. Who? he shouted. Isaiah, I didn't mean to. It was a mistake, cried Annabelle frantically. It only happened one time. Who? Your brother Philip, said Reverend Smith. At top speed, Isaiah was out of the study before his father could grab him, nearly breaking the door as he charged straight for Philip. You bastard! Screamed Isaiah in such a rage. I will kill you! The 16-year-old was on top of his 21-year-old brother before anyone had a chance to even think. So sudden was Isaiah's attack that Philip did not even have time to defend himself. In a blink of an eye, the two brothers were on the ground, with Isaiah on top, raining down punch after punch, before wrapping his hands around his brother's neck. Isaac immediately ran out of the study and shouted to his older sons in German, just don't stand there, you idiots! Let me stop this before they kill each other! Isaac Jr., Ichabod, and Malachi joined their father in pulling Isaiah off of Philip. To say that such a feat was difficult is an understatement. Isaiah was full of uncontrollable rage and was swinging at anyone who got in his way. It had to take his father, three older brothers, and all three of his brothers-in-law to pin him to the ground, just to calm him down, which took about 10 to 15 minutes. During the next hour, Reverend Smith explained the situation to everyone. Leah was embarrassed and angry at her younger sister for breaking Isaiah's heart and bringing shame onto the family, while Philip confessed to sleeping with Annabelle and the possibility that he was the father of her unborn child. It happened at the spring picnic last month, he said. I'm not proud of what I did. I was drunk. Is that all you have to say? said an angry Ichabod. He, along with Malachi, as well as David, were still holding Isaiah, who was staring with seething hatred at Philip. What the hell do you want me to say? responded Philip. I'm sorry, it isn't going to change what happened between Annabelle and me that night. Give me one good reason I shouldn't release your brother and let him kill you, 
said Isaac. Enough, shouted Catherine. There will be no killing, especially between my children. The Reinhardt matriarch slowly walked to Isaiah and gently touched his cheek. He is still your brother, Isaiah. Isaiah softened a bit, though he still wanted to kill his brother, but his love for both his parents was stronger than his hatred for Philip. Let me go, he said. Ichabod, Malachi, and David looked at their mother, who just nodded in response, and they released their grip on him. Catherine stood between Isaiah and Philip, just in case Isaiah decided to have a go at his brother again. Isaac, Sister Catherine, said Reverend Smith, I am genuinely sorry for the pain that my daughter has caused your family. She isn't alone in this one, Reverend, said Isaac, who just stared at Philip. So what happens now? I wish to God I knew, said Reverend Smith. I have a solution, said Philip. Everyone was silent. Since I am the father of Annabelle's baby, the right thing for the both of us to do is get married. Catherine gently placed her hand on Isaiah's arm. She could easily feel his rage rising again, and she silently prayed that he wouldn't do anything he would regret. But I don't want to marry you, Philip, said Annabelle. You would rather live here and have everyone know that you're raising a bastard child. I hate to agree with him, said Reverend Smith, but he has a point. Father, said a surprised Leah, what about Isaiah? Everyone turned to Isaiah, who stood beside his mother. Still in a rage, he immediately walked off, leaving the Jackson home. Son, wait, called Catherine, but Isaac stopped her. Let him go he said. Right now, it is better if he is by himself. Chapter 2. Going West A couple of hours later, back at the Reinhardt home, Isaiah Reinhardt returned from his solitude after his brother and sweetheart's betrayal. During that time, it was accepted that Philip would marry Annabelle to protect her reputation and avoid bringing further shame to both families. Isaiah knew that was inevitable, so he decided he should leave Beaufort for good. He had heard stories of men going west to become trappers from men who worked on the riverboats coming from St. Louis and going north to New York, and he'd seen ships loaded with beaver pelts going to Europe. He had heard of the Corps of Discovery, led by Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, who went west to the unexplored territory that President Thomas Jefferson bought from France in 1803. They had not yet returned, but that did not interest him. He just wanted to get out of Beaufort and away from his family. He quietly sneaked back into the family home and packed some things for his journey, among them his musket that his father gave him for his birthday six years previously, his hunting knife, powder horn, a Bible, a book by Jonathan Swift entitled Gulliver's Travels, and some money that he had been saving up from working at his father's shipbuilding business, and also from selling his pelts from the animals that he had trapped and killed. Not wanting to wake up Malachi, Micah, or Manoah, he said a silent goodbye to his brothers and slowly crept down the hallway to the stairs. You're not at least going to say goodbye, asked a voice in a thick German accent. Isaiah immediately turned around, startled, to find his father standing in the middle of the hallway in his trousers. I did not want to wake you and mother. Who said I was asleep, said Isaac. I have been up all night waiting for you to come home and I was standing outside your room watching you. I can't stay here, Papa, said Isaiah. If I see Philip again, I will kill him, and I might just kill Annabelle as well for betraying me. There was no might, Isaac thought. He knew his son. Isaiah had never been outwardly violent. He always kept his emotions bottled up, even when Philip bullied him. He had never been as violent as he was tonight. I guess it is for the best, said Isaac. You sure you want to do this? If I don't leave, it will bring more shame to the family, answered Isaiah. I don't believe Mother could handle losing two sons. His father sighed and slowly walked to him. Come with me. I have something to show you. Isaiah followed his father downstairs to the cabinet in the living room. Isaac pulled open the bottom drawer and took out a box. When he opened it, he showed his son two flintlock pistols. The year 1781 was engraved in them. General George Washington gave me these pistols himself at the Battle of Yorktown, he said. 
I was probably one of a handful of Germans to fight on the side of the Americans. That couldn't have been easy for you, said Isaiah. Fighting for freedom, so that your children can live free, is never easy, said his father. Take them. They are now yours. Isaiah was hesitant, but after looking in his father's tear-filled eyes, he took the pistols. The boy knew all about guns, but this was the first time he had seen one from the Revolutionary War. Isaac looked at his young son. Even in the candlelit dark, he could see his own features in him. Just one of two of the ten Reinhardt children that looked more like their father, inheriting the German blonde hair and blue eyes. It was clear to Isaiah that his father didn't want him to leave, but leave he must. As they left the house together to the stables, Isaac gave his son some extra money for his travels. Do you know where you are going? West, I believe, answered Isaiah as he saddled his horse. To St. Louis. Beyond that, where the wind takes me. His father nodded, then was in deep thought. I am truly sorry about this, Isaiah, he said. I often wonder where I went wrong with your brother. Isaiah wanted to tell his father that the shame wasn't his to bear, but he was too hurt and angry. He loved this family very much, his parents the most, which is why he couldn't stay. If he killed Philip and possibly Annabelle, he would be charged with murder, tried, convicted, and hanged, and his parents would be burying two sons and his eldest brother would be burying a sister-in-law. Also, he did not want to rob Reverend and Mrs. Smith of a daughter and future grandchild. No, it was better this way. At least he could start his life over either in St. Louis or beyond, whichever came first. I was going to marry her, Papa, said Isaiah. His father just nodded. Forgive her, son said Isaac. Your brother, too. <laughs> Easier said than done, said Isaiah. His father placed a hand on his shoulder. I know, but try, for your mother's sake, he said. Isaiah nodded, then hugged his father. What felt like an eternity only lasted a single minute. Then it was time to go. One more thing, said Isaac. There are evil people in this world, son, who will take advantage of you and kill you. You know how to use a gun, so don't be afraid to use it. I will, Papa. With those last words, Isaiah kicked his horse's sides with his heels and rode off into the night. He waved goodbye to his father, who gave a slight wave back, a single tear running down his cheek. Little did either of them know that Catherine had been watching from the master bedroom window, saying a silent prayer to the Almighty to protect her son, wherever he was going. A wave of tears ran down her cheeks as she opened a Bible to a verse from the book she named her son after, Isaiah 49.25. But thus, says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible be delivered. For I will contend with him who contends with thee, and I will save thy children. Chapter 3. St. Louis Around the middle of May, Isaiah arrived in St. Louis. He was amazed at the small frontier town, compared to the city of his birth, Beaufort, South Carolina. He had come across many towns in his travels since leaving Beaufort, but none were as extravagant and mesmerizing as St. Louis, which was still a small town compared to his later years. Founded in 1764 by Pierre Leclerc and his stepson, Auguste Choteau, St. Louis was once under the rule of three countries. Great Britain, Spain, and then France ruled over it, until President Thomas Jefferson bought it from Napoleon Bonaparte in 1803, as part of what would be known as a Louisiana Purchase. After his purchase, St. Louis would be the capital of and the gateway to the west of the Mississippi River. It was a main reason why President Jefferson commissioned Lewis and Clark to head the Corps of Discovery, to explore the territory just over two years previously in May. By the time Isaiah Reinhardt arrived, the Corps Discovery had not yet returned, and it was rumored that they either got lost or perished. Isaiah was hungry. It had been a day since he last ate, and he did not have enough money left when he arrived in St. Louis. After taking in the sights, he tried to find a place to eat that he could afford, but with little luck. He decided to check the docks of St. Louis to see if he could get something to eat and find work. 
He entered a not-so-clean and very dingy tavern, where he approached the proprietor. Excuse me, sir, he said. The gentleman was a short, chubby man with a preceding hairline. He was dressed in a wool shirt and had a dirty apron that covered his overalls, which were a little small for his pot-bellied frame. He gave Isaiah his full attention. Well, what can I do for you? I was wondering if you're hiring, said Isaiah. I am a hard worker and willing to work for my food. The proprietor gave Isaiah a smirk and said, You must be very hungry and desperate to work for food. Hungry, yes. Desperate, no. The man gave a husky laugh and coughed up mucus from his lungs before spitting it out in a bucket. What is your name, son? Isaiah Reinhardt, sir. You're not in any trouble, are you? asked the proprietor. Because I don't hire people on the run from the law. Nothing of the sort, said Isaiah. Just looking for some temporary work, so I can start over before I starve. The man laughed again. <laughs> start over, he said. You look too young to be starting over on anything. Isaiah just shrugged. The proprietor was in deep thought when he asked. How old are you, Isaiah? Just turned 16 this past February 1st. Where are you from, if you don't mind me asking? South Carolina. The proprietor raised an eyebrow. Well, I detect a bit of German and what appears to be some Irish in your southern accent. Again, Isaiah just shrugged. My father is from Germany. He's a shipbuilder, he said. My mother is from Boston, but her parents were from Ireland. German, Irish, and from South Carolina, said the proprietor. That is one hell of a mixture. Name's Barnes, Emmett Barnes, he said as he offered a hand to Isaiah. You said your daddy's a shipbuilder? Isaiah nodded. So you have experience in making boats and such. I do, but I have worked at loading docks in my hometown of Beaufort, said Isaiah. Barnes nodded and was again in deep thought. It just so happens I own a warehouse down by the docks that loads and unloads supplies on the river boats here in St. Louis. I could use someone like you. I appreciate it, said Isaiah. You won't regret it, Mr. Barnes. The pudgy man just smiled as he shook Isaiah's hand. He was impressed with the youth's firm handshake and sensed he made the right decision in hiring him. Despite working around rivermen and ruffians his whole life, Emmett Barnes was a decent and successful businessman. The tavern that he ran was one of three businesses he owned. The others were the warehouse by the docks and his family farm that his eldest son Eric ran. Now, for your hunger, said Emmett. You got any money to pay for it? I do not have a lot of money, said Isaiah, but as I mentioned, I am willing to work for food. That won't be necessary, said Emmett. Hey, Talby, come out here for a minute. A black man came from the kitchen. He was tall, medium-complexioned, and looked to be as strong as an ox. This here's Talbot, said Emmett. He's one of my cooks, and not to mention the best damn mule skinner this side of the Mississippi. Isaiah shook the black man's hand and almost winced at the firm grip of his handshake. <laughs> that, that is quite a grip you got there, he said. The negro just laughed. Comes with the job. Got to take Isaiah to the farm and have Betsy cook up some grub for him, said Emmett. No problem, Mr. Barnes, said Talbot. Come on, Isaiah. Thank you, Mr. Barnes, said Isaiah. You're welcome. You can start tomorrow. Over the next two months... Isaiah lived with Emmett Barnes and his family and worked for him at the docks, unloading and loading supplies from river boats coming and going from New Orleans and up and down the Mississippi River. It turned out that Emmett Barnes was in his late 40s and his wife Betsy was in her early 40s. They had three sons, Eric, Earl, and Emmett Jr., and a daughter Betty who was the same age as Isaiah. Talbot was a freed slave whom Emmett hired as both a cook and mule skinner, and he and Isaiah became fast friends despite the age difference, as Talbot was almost 30. Among the Barnes' children, Isaiah became friends with Emmett Jr. and Betty. Emmett Jr. was 17, and like Isaiah, was a man of the woods, and preferred hunting in his free time, which was right up Isaiah's alley. The two, along with Talbot, when he had free time, would go hunting in the woods and bring back lots of game for the stew pot. One morning, Isaiah saved Emmett Jr.'s life from an enraged black bear, by distracting the beast and allowing it to get close enough to empty both of his flintlock pistols at point-blank range into the beast's skull. Emmett Sr. held a great feast in Isaiah's honor for saving his youngest son's life. 
It was July 4th of that year that would change Isaiah's life. He and Emmett Jr. went to the tavern to celebrate Independence Day. While Isaiah was not a heavy drinker, which is one of the things that Betty liked about him, he had no problem letting loose. While he, Emmett Sr. and Jr., along with Talbot, made a toast at the bar, one of the patrons, a drunken belligerent man named Beecher, approached. Hey, Barnes, he said. Since when did you start letting engines in here? Barnes looked at the drunk, who was pointing to a trapper, and his companion, who appeared to be an Indian, but actually looked mixed. Barnes recognized a trapper. Anyone who's hungry or thirsty has the money to pay for their food and is welcome in my establishment, said Emmett Sr. What is wrong with you, Barnes? said Beecher. It's bad enough you serve and hire Negroes, but a line has to be drawn at engines. The trapper who was listening to the entire conversation had heard enough and approached Beecher. Is that a problem, mon ami? You're damn right there's a problem, froggy, said Beecher. That pet engine you brought in here. Beecher, that is enough from you, said Barnes. However, the French trapper raised his hands to Barnes. It was clear to everyone they knew each other. Is that a pet engine, as you call him, said the trapper. He is my own son, and he would like an apology. A half-breed, shouted Beecher. That's even worse! Without warning, the trapper smashed a whiskey bottle over Beecher's head, causing the big man to drop to the floor, bleeding from his skull. Some patrons tried to get involved, but Emmett Sr., Talbot, Isaiah, and Emmett Jr. intervened, courtesy of sawed-off shotguns and Isaiah's flintlock pistols. Stand down, everyone, said the elder Barnes. This is a private matter. Despite bleeding from the top of his skull, Beecher was still conscious and full of rage. His hand was on his knife handle, when he suddenly was staring down the barrel of not one, but two rifles. The trapper, and now his half-Indian son, were at the other end of those rifles. You uh, never bring a knife to a gunfight, said the trapper. Beecher immediately released the knife handle and quickly sobered up. I believe it's time for you to leave, Beecher, said Barnes. Suddenly, Isaiah noticed one of the patrons behind the trapper, and his son pulled a knife and was about to stab one of them in the back. Look out! He shouted as he quickly raised one of his flintlock pistols and fired, hitting the would-be assassin in his right eye before the man had a chance to bury his knife in the trapper's back. The trapper and his son quickly turned to the downed man, realizing that the youth had just saved their lives. In the brief moment of distraction, Beecher went for his knife again and tried to kill the trapper, but Isaiah saw him in a split second and blasted him in the cranium with his remaining loaded flintlock pistol. The trapper and his son looked at Isaiah in amazement, as well as Barnes and Talbot, who were also impressed. Twice in less than a minute to save our lives, mon ami, said the trapper. Merci beaucoup. I'm sorry, I, I don't speak French, said Isaiah. He is saying thank you for saving his life, said Emmett Barnes Sr., and the life of his son. Oh, you're welcome. The elder Barnes had someone retrieve the constable, knowing the incident would have to be explained. While they were waiting, he turned and greeted the trapper and his son. Welcome back to St. Louis, Jacques and Pierre, he said. It has been a long time. Chapter 4 Jacques Ludo Emmett Barnes had known the French trapper known as Jacques Ludo for almost 20 years. Born in Paris, Jacques served in the French army and fought on the side of the Americans at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. He was honorably discharged after the French and American Allied victory over the British, and instead of going back home to France, he decided to head to the frontier, where he met some French-Canadian trappers, who took him under their wing and taught him how to be a trapper. He had traveled as far west to what are now the states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, and had traded with many of the tribes of the Northern Plains and the Rocky Mountains, learning their ways and cultures. One particular tribe that he not only currently and exclusively traded with, but now lived with, were the Assiniboines. Calling themselves the Ho or the Nakoda, the tribe was closely related to the Sioux or Lakota. Their territories were what is today eastern Montana to western North Dakota, up to Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba in Canada. Jacques had lived among the tribes since 1786, marrying an Assiniboine woman and fathering three children. 18-year-old Pierre Ledeau was Jacques' eldest son. 
This was his second adventure to St. Louis with his father. The last time he was here was two years previously. While marriage between trappers and Indian women were common during the fur trade, like their traditional counterparts, they were not based on love, but out of necessity and business. However, Jacques Ludo loved his wife, Cypher's bird woman, who was a mother of Pierre and their two daughters, Lisette and Marie. As the constable arrived at the tavern, Jacques Ludo was buying Isaiah Reinhardt a drink for saving not only his life, but the life of his son, not once, but twice in such a short time. Emmett Barnes explained to him that the two homicides were justifiable, for Beecher and his friend tried to stab Jacques and his son when they weren't looking, and Isaiah managed to shoot them dead before they had the chance. The constable clearly didn't have any love for trappers or Indians, but he accepted the explanation. Emmett Barnes was well respected in St. Louis. As a result, the matter was closed. After the bodies were removed from the tavern by the authorities, Jacques offered to pour Isaiah another drink, but the youth humbly declined. However, he did ask the trapper to offer his friends Emma Jr. and Talbot a cup, which the Frenchman gladly did. A toast, mon ami, he said, to the brave man here and to the new fence. As the toast went up, Isaiah was noticeably quiet, which caught Pierre's attention. You have never killed a man before today, eh? How did you guess? asked Isaiah. You can tell about a man's past through the passage of the eyes, said Pierre. Magnifique! said Jacques, as he beamed with pride at his only son. But he too was curious about Isaiah. Today was the first time I have killed any man, said Isaiah. Can't say how I am feeling about it. You was a murderer, Isaiah, said the younger Emmett Barnes. You saved Jacques and Pierre from being murdered. You did what you had to do. He is right, mon ami, said Jacques. We are in your debt. You don't have to do that, Mr. Ledeau, said Isaiah. S'il vous plaît, said Jacques. Call me Jacques. And you can call me Pierre, said the younger Ledeau, offering his hand. Isaiah accepted it and shook. Where do you come from? he asked. From the west, said Jacques. From the land of the Assiniboine Indians. That got the youth's attention. How long have you lived out there? Jacques just shrugged. Oh, going on twenty years now, maybe more? You must like living out there, said Isaiah, among the Indians. <laughs> well, I better, laughed Jacques. My wife and children are Indian, as you can see. Well, I meant no offense. <laughs> None taken. Where are you from, Isaiah? asked Pierre. South Carolina. Is that? What is that? Far east towards the Atlantic Ocean, said Isaiah. It is below North Carolina and borders uh, Tennessee and Georgia, said Jacques Ledeau. I am correct, oui? Isaiah nodded. You seem to know a lot about my country, Jacques. I have served in the French army at the Battle of Yorktown with you Americans before I came west, said Jacques. You learn about your friend's country when you fight a common enemy. <laughs> you speak better English than me, said Isaiah. The Frenchman laughed. It's in the benefits of having a wealthy childhood, he said. You get a good education. Don't you miss France? Do you miss a South Carolina? retorted Jacques. Touche. The other Barnes and Talbot sensed when the conversation was going, and decided to leave Isaiah and Emma Jr. to the two trappers, while work in the tavern still had to be done. You are from uh, the South, Isaiah, said Jacques. But I detect a bit of the Irish in your accent, and your name sounds uh, German. Isaiah just shrugged a little. My father is German, while my mother is the daughter of Irish immigrants, he said. Her people were from Cork, while my father is from Hamburg. That is a one hell of a mixture, laughed Jacques. Isaiah took the jest good-naturedly. Can you tell us about the West? asked Emma Jr., Lewis and Clark went out there about two years ago, and they haven't been back since. I, too, have heard of the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition, said Jock. He said if the Chabonneau can stay sober long enough, they should have uh, no trouble getting back to St. Louis. What about uh, Lewis, Papa? asked Pierre. That mess he made with the uh, Blackfeet at the Medicine River last year. He's lucky to still be alive. Jacques nodded in agreement with his son. 
The revelation that Lewis and Clark were still alive definitely intrigued Isaiah and the younger Barnes. Some of the patrons were listening too at the revelation. What is it like out there? asked Isaiah. Jacques smiled. Pierre rolled his eyes a bit as his father was about to go into one of his storytellings about home. It is the Garden of Eden, mon ami, he said. You cross thousands of miles of beautiful Paris, just before you hit the uh, rocky mountains. Then, from the distance, you get snow on top of those mountains, even before the summer months. Tell them about the buffalo herds, said Pierre. I was getting to that, retorted his father. You are almost have to half a day before you see a buffalo herd, as long as the Mississippi from horizon to horizon. I have heard of buffaloes before, but I have never seen one, asked Isaiah. Neither have I, said Emma Jr. Most men who live east of the Mississippi haven't, said Jock. The beasts are three times the size of a horse, and they are quite delicious. What about the Indians that live there? asked Isaiah. What about them? Are they friendly? Jacques just shrugged. Some are and some aren't, but that is not the issue. The Frenchman paused for a moment to make sure he had their undivided attention. Indians are no different than you or me, he said. They have strange ways and customs, too, but our ways are no stranger than theirs. You treat them with respect and they will treat you the same way. Even the unfriendly ones, asked Isaiah. Even the unfriendly ones answered Jock. What are the women like? asked Emmett. The Frenchman smiled. He remembered when he was young and full of excitement, especially when it came to the ladies. You'll come across some types that will give you a woman. Really? shouted the younger Barnes. His father had been listening from the bar and walked over and gently placed his hand on his son's shoulder to calm him down. Nothing to get too excited about, boy. How did you come to live among your wife's people? Asked Isaiah. By trading with them, answered Jacques. And shopping beaver. I used to do a lot of trapping during my free time back in South Carolina, said Isaiah. Now it was Jacques' turn to be intrigued. Do tell, he said. What kind of pelts? Oh, uh, fox, otter, raccoon, weasel, skunks, and sometimes black bear. Interesting, said Jacques. And the beaver? No, said Isaiah. Why? Even Pierre was curious why his father asked the question about Beaver. Would you like to learn how to talk Beaver? Asked Jacques. Better yet, would you like to invest with us and become a mountain man? Chapter 5 Another Big Decision Isaiah was surprised at what Jacques Ludeau had offered him. The French trapper and his son had just met the youth, though they knew the Barnes family very well. Why would you invite me to return with you and offer to teach me how to become a trapper? He asked. You don't even know me. Touche, said Jacques. But I see something in your eyes. See a man looking for something as if he is trying to start over. Isaiah knew the Frenchman hit the nail on the head. He never told anyone, not even the Barnes family, why he left South Carolina. How he became close to murdering his brother and his own sweetheart for having an affair behind his back, and Abigail getting pregnant. That was just almost three months prior. But the sting of his brother's betrayal was hurtful. He still felt it as if it were yesterday. He hid it well, which was the main reason he wasn't planning on staying in St. Louis for long, and working for an Emmett Barnes Sr. permanently. He wanted to start over, but for some reason St. Louis didn't feel like the place to start over, even though it was hundreds of miles from Beaufort, South Carolina. That is when he realized Jacques Ludeau had just offered him the opportunity of a lifetime to start over in the fur trade. I am interested in your offer, Jacques, he said. If I may ask, how much can a man make from trapping beaver? Good question, answered Jacques. As long as the white people are still buying beaver hats here in America, England, and France, I say at least up to $6,000 a year. Isaiah's eyes were wide as saucers. Is that why you still live out west? No, answered Jacques. Money is useless in the mountains. We trade for our supplies, but make uh, no mistake, I have made uh, plenty of money. 
Then why not return to Saint Louis? Asked Isaiah. Freedom, mon ami, answered Jacques. True, unlimited freedom, which is what is lacking here in these settlements. If I were a black man, I would agree with that statement, chuckled Isaiah. He never subscribed to the practice of slavery, or that a person should be judged by their skin color, a feeling and a belief that Jacques clearly shared. Negroes have it worse, true, but the whites are slaves and they do not even know it, he said. They don't understand what a true freedom is all about. You can show me what it's all about. We. Oui. Isaiah spent the next day thinking over Jacques' proposition. Emmett Jr., who would have been listening to the conversation, was interested as well, but he wasn't too sure if the fur trade business was for him. Jacques had explained to both of them that it was dangerous work, facing the elements of winter, starvation, wild animals, accidents, hostile Indians, and worse, other trappers who would rob you blind and slit your throat. Isaiah, however, felt that he needed an adventure, and after breakfast that morning, he decided to tell the elder Barnes his decision. That afternoon, during his lunch break, he stopped into Mr. Barnes's office at the warehouse. May I have a moment in private, Mr. Barnes? Of course you can, Isaiah, said Mr. Barnes. What is on your mind? First and foremost, said Isaiah, I wish to thank you and your family for all the kindness you have given me, as well as allowing me to work for you. But I believe it is time for me to move on now. Emmett Barnes was not surprised. Isaiah was an excellent worker at the docks and he knew boats, being the son of a shipbuilder. But Barnes sensed that the youth was not content. Where will you go? Jacques Ledeau and his son offered to take me to the wilderness and teach me how to become a trapper, answered Isaiah. It was something I felt I couldn't refuse. I sense that, said Mr. Barnes. Emma Jr. told me about your conversation with Jacques, and as far as having someone to teach you the fur trade, Jacques is the best. You must know him very well, then, said Isaiah. Almost twenty years now, said Mr. Barnes. I knew nothing about his family. I have met his son only twice. Not to sound suspicious, said Isaiah, but is he trustworthy? Mr. Barnes just smiled. About as trustworthy as any man walking on water. <laughs> that is one hell of a recommendation, said a surprised Isaiah. I like to think that I am a good judge of character, said Mr. Barnes. I will be honest, Isaiah. I will miss you, and so will everybody else. Feeling almost guilty, Isaiah just sighed. I am sure you will find a better employee than me. Other than my sons and perhaps Talbot, I can't think of a more trustworthy hard worker than you. Now Isaiah was a little embarrassed by the praise the elder Barnes showered upon him. If it is okay with you, he said, I would like to finish out my day and then go find Jacques and Pierre and tell them I have accepted their offer. That is fine by me, said Mr. Barnes. When will you be leaving? As soon as they are. Don't forget to say goodbye to the family, especially Betty, said Mr. Barnes. She has had her eyes on you since you got here. I am not ready for that again, said Isaiah. Emmett Barnes raised an eyebrow. Again? Long story, said Isaiah. You still have half an hour left, said Mr. Barnes. Want to tell it if you have time? Isaiah lowered his head for a moment in the thought, then raised it as he looked into the bland face of the man who was both his employer and his friend. I left South Carolina because I was betrayed by my brother and someone I loved. How bad was his betrayal? asked Mr. Barnes. I was going to ask her to marry me, said Isaiah. But she and my brother Philip had a flame behind my back, and she ended up pregnant with his baby. Ouch! He was silent for a moment. Emmett Sr. had strong sympathy for Isaiah. You left home because of that? It was either leave, said Isaiah or kill my brother and possibly her and bring further shame and pain to my family. Uh, you probably did the right thing then, said Mr. Barnes. But I can't see you killing your own flesh and blood or a pregnant woman for that matter. You think not, huh? asked Isaiah. And with all due respect, Mr. Barnes, you don't know me very well. I know cold-blooded killers, said Mr. Barnes. You are not one of them. No matter how angry you get, you still have a conscience. I killed those two men last night in your tavern. 
In order to save the lives of Jacques and Pierre, said Mr. Barnes. I must say I was impressed by your quick thinking. That took a lot of gumption. But doesn't that make me a killer? Asked Isaiah. Not the kind that a man would deserve to be hanged for, said Mr. Barnes. You are a good man, Isaiah, and I know you feel you have been hurt by your flesh and blood, but they are still your flesh and blood. So you suggest that I should forgive my brother and Annabelle? I didn't say that, said Mr. Barnes with a smile. But don't spend the rest of your life hating them, especially your brother, for hate never did anyone any good. Isaiah just smiled. You should have been a preacher, Mr. Barnes. Emmett Barnes gave a look of disgust. My daddy was a preacher and the worst kind, he said. One Bible thump and hellfire and brimstone dandy in my family is enough. Both the youth and his employer had a good laugh. By the way, said Mr. Barnes, what happened to your brother and your sweetheart? He suggested to her parents that he marry her since he was the father. Wait a minute. How do you know that he was the father and not you? Asked Mr. Barnes. Because I never slept with her during our entire courtship would last it a year, answered Isaiah. And when she got pregnant, she confessed to her parents about the affair, and they told me and my parents. Emma just shook his head. Well, to his credit, at least he is taking some responsibility. Isaiah just shrugged. If you say so. Later that evening, Isaiah visited Jacques and Pierre Ludo at their hotel to inform them that he accepted their offer. Magnifique! shouted the French trapper. You will not regret it. But I must warn you, it is not for the ill because hot. Topping is very hard work, and again, I must warn you, it is very dangerous work. I understand, said Isaiah. When do you leave? First we must get you uh, outfitted. Isaiah was just noticing the buckskin outfits that both father and son wore. He also noticed hair hanging from their belts. Jacques had five of them, while Pierre had two. Isaiah asked about them as he pointed to them. Those are scalps, mon ami, answered Jacques. As in human scalps? asked the shock Isaiah. We, oui, answered Jacques. Isaiah had heard of Indians taking scalps off white men and each other, but he wasn't sure if he would ever see such a gruesome trophy. Jacques showed his trophies to the youth. These the are from Avricara Warriors, he said. The choppers call them V's, but I don't. And those two, asked Isaiah as he pointed to the last two scalps that looked way lighter than the other three. Those were two basto choppers that tried to have their way with my wife and eldest daughter, answered Jacques. As you can see, I do not take kindly to that. Remind me to stay on your good side, said Isaiah. Jacques just guffawed and patted the youth on his back. Isaiah turned to Pierre and asked him about his two scalps. They are from two white men who tried to steal from us, answered Pierre. They will never steal from anyone again. Pierre was not the talkative type. He was more reserved, but his father was more of a jovial type, which Isaiah liked. Have you told Monsieur Barnes that you have accepted my offer? Asked Jacques. Isaiah nodded. He gave a glowing recommendation of you and said you were the best to teach about the ways of a trapper. Not just the ways of a trapper, mon ami, said Jacques. The ways of a mountain man. Either way, I will give you both my best, said a confident Isaiah. Both father and son were impressed by the youth's confidence. For his age, Isaiah was bold. A little naive, but very confident. Something else that the French trapper saw was maturity. It was a treat that he had rarely seen even among his fellow adult trappers. Pierre was different. He was born in the wilderness among his mother's people, the Assiniboine. Being a semi-nomadic people, they had been trapping and trading as well as just living in the wilderness for thousands of years. So for him, these things were second nature. Jacques remembered when he first came west after the Revolutionary War all those years ago. He was a little older than Isaiah back then, but he too was naive, but bold and mature. Seeing a similar thing in the youth who had saved his life and the life of his son the night before brought back those memories. Chapter 6 The Adventure Begins Isaiah Reinhardt left St. Louis with the Ludos in the third week of July. While most French trappers preferred to travel to St. Louis from the western wilderness and back by canoe, 
Jacques Ledeau preferred to travel to overland by horseback. Before they left, Isaiah said goodbye to the Barnes family and again thanked them for their friendship and kindness. Emmett and Mrs. Barnes both promised that if he ever decided to come back and settle, he would be welcomed with open arms. And he would have a job waiting for him. Out of all the Barnes' children, Betty was sad to see him go the most. She was just about Isaiah's age, and her parents would have never objected to Isaiah courting her, but it was not meant to be. As he was riding on the same brown stallion that brought him into St. Louis, Isaiah thought about his family back in Beaufort. While he was still enraged to Philip, he still loved and missed the rest of his siblings and parents, as well as his nephews and nieces. As he accepted that there would be no other possibility of returning to St. Louis to live and settle, he also removed the thought of ever returning to Beaufort, South Carolina. He decided that his place was wherever the wind took him. So much was he in his thoughts that he almost lost control over the pack horse he was pulling behind him. Careful, mon ami, warned Jacques. Sorry, Jacques, responded Isaiah. Lost in my thoughts for a moment. Thinking of home, no? Isaiah was just about to ask the Frenchman how he knew that when the latter turned around and said, I felt the same way as you did when I came out of these distant lands so long ago. Do you miss France? asked Isaiah. Mon Dieu, no, said Jacques. I had no regrets either. When you see the shining mountains and the rest of the family, you will understand why. Pierre just rolled his eyes. He knew his father was anxious to get back to his mother for what would be the best lovemaking she would have in a long time, at least according to his father. The mixed blood of Cinnabon youth was anxious to get back to his people also, but for different reasons. He had been courting Shooting Star Woman, the daughter of Chief Yellow Wolf, who was a friend of his parents. He brought many pieces of jewelry, fufara, two hand mirrors, and even a bright blue dress for her. When he returned, he planned on going on a horse raiding expedition so that he could bring her father enough horses as a bride price for her hand in marriage. You don't talk very much, said Isaiah to Pierre. Just on noticing that, eh? Pierre may have been older than Isaiah by two years, but he was not as tall. In fact, neither was his father, who was five foot eight. Pierre himself was five foot ten, making the greenhorn Isaiah the tallest of the trio. A wise man told me once said Pierre. It is better to have open ears and a closed mouth than closed ears and an open mouth. Isaiah seemed to understand where Pierre was coming from. Sounds like something my papa would say. You never spoke of your people back in South Carolina, said Pierre. Nor your reason for leaving. Jacques turned around in his saddle to his son. You should never ask about the man's past son, he said. If Isaiah wants to volunteer information about his past, then he will. But I know I have taught you that it is rude to ask. It's okay, said Isaiah. I don't mind. Jacques nodded before he added. Like this is your first lesson as a mountain man, Isaiah. Never ask another man about his past. Why? Because some men who come out west from the settlements are escaping from the law, answered Jacques. Such men would rather keep such secrets exactly that. Secrets. I will remember that. Jacques nodded and smiled before turning back to face front on his horse. Isaiah and Pierre rode behind him side by side while they each pulled the pack horse. To keep his mind off the unending prairie, Isaiah continued the conversation with Pierre. To answer your question, Pierre, he said, I left home because I was betrayed by two people I loved. Betrayed how? asked Pierre. And by who? Jacques had been keenly listening, but at the same time, his eyes were on the surrounding environment, keeping a lookout. There was this girl that I had been courting for a year, said Isaiah. I was going to ask her to marry me, but she had an affair with my older brother and got pregnant as a result. Sacre bleu! exclaimed both father and son. You left because of that? asked Pierre. If I didn't, I probably would have killed both of them, responded Isaiah. I did not want to bring more pain and shame to my parents than my brother has already done. That is understandable, said Jacques, looking over his shoulder. But how did you know the baby was your brother's and not yours? Because I am a virgin, said Isaiah, and she told her parents that he was the only man she slept with, and they told us. Mon Dieu, said Jacques, I am sorry that happened to you, mon ami. 
If you can't trust your own blood, then who can you trust? Said Pierre. Most people I have met will tell you that those who have hurt them the most have been their own family. Said Jacques. Pierre looked at his father, surprised. Then he remembered that he knew very little of his father's upbringing or his people back in France. Isaiah wanted to ask Jacques why he never returned to France, but then he remembered never to pry. Thank you for the sympathy, he said instead. Jacques was about to say more, but as he continued to look over his shoulder, his expression changed. We are being followed, he said. Isaiah and Pierre looked over their shoulders and saw nothing, but Pierre knew better than to question his father's intuition. For some reason, Isaiah also sensed that it was wise to be silent and not question the Frenchman either. What it would do? They are about a mile or two behind us, said Jacques. We will go for higher ground and have the advantage over them. Maybe they're going west to trap beaver like us, said Isaiah. Maybe, said Jacques. But you don't think so? asked Pierre. His father shrugged. He pointed straight ahead to some rolling hills and thought that would give them an advantage. They were only three days out of St. Louis and they just passed what would become the town of Independence, Missouri. Jacques did not want to take any chances, and they continued to ride on as if everything was all right. They managed to get to high ground, find shelter, and stake out their horses. Jacques had an old Charleville rifle that he had since his days in the French army during the Revolutionary War, and he had a new Kentucky rifle, along with two 1786 pistolet models. Pierre, too, had a Kentucky rifle and a bow and arrow that he normally used for hunting in order to save ammunition. Both father and son were also armed heavily with two Arkansas toothpicks, two scalping knives, and an Assiniboine tomahawk each. Isaiah was armed with the two flintlock pistols that his father gave him and a 1795 Springfield model musket the one that his father gave him for his 10th birthday just six years previously. Among his armory, he also had two Arkansas toothpicks, courtesy of Jacques and Pierre, and an 1805 Derringer pistol that he hid in his right boot. As he took up his position, he said a silent prayer that whoever was following them meant no harm. When he killed the man called Beecher and his companion for trying to stab Jacques and Pierre in the back, he knew it wasn't a murder, but it still shook him. It was the first time he ever took a life even if it was to save another. Now here, he was in a situation in which he might have to take another life in order to save not just his friends again, but himself too. Then he remembered what his father told him before he left South Carolina. There are evil people in this world who will try and kill you, just because they can. Don't be afraid to use those guns when it is necessary. About an hour or so later, three men rode into view. One of them was staring down, checking for tracks. From a distance, Isaiah recognized one of them. He was at the tavern the night he killed Beecher and his friend. Jacques immediately cocked his rifle and shouted from his position. What can I do for you, mon ami? The three strangers immediately jumped in their saddles when they realized that they had been caught. The one who was tracking Jacques and his party immediately went for one of his pistols. I would have that if I was you, monsieur, warned Jacques. The tracker paused for a minute, trying to assess the situation. His two friends were looking in all directions to see where the voice was coming from. Show yourself, you frog bastard! shouted the tracker. Now why would I do such a thing? laughed Jacques. Because you killed my brother, Beecher, said the tracker. You and that half-breed mongrel of yours. You have it all wrong, mister, shouted Isaiah. His position was behind the trio. He had his rifle cocked and ready, and was pointing it at the nearest bushwhacker. Your brother and his friend were trying to stab Mr. Ledeau and his son in the back, he said. I couldn't allow that to happen. Then you will be the first to die, shouted the tracker as he again went for his pistol. Pierre shot from his bow and arrow, catching the tracker right in the throat. He was dead before he hit the ground. His two friends, who already had out their rifles, tried to aim and fire in Pierre's direction but Jacques and Isaiah immediately opened fire on them. The head of the bushwhacker closest to Isaiah exploded like a watermelon before his limp body fell to the earth. The other bushwhacker found himself staring at the new hole in his chest courtesy of Jacques' Charleville rifle. Within seconds, he too went limp and fell to the earth, never to rise again. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence, where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Isaiah Reinhardt in Where the Wind Takes You by Leroy A. Peters.